Hi, everybody. Welcome to Smarter News. My name is Jenna. I am a journalist and also the founder of Smarter News. And I'm so glad you're here today for this conversation that I'm so looking forward to, albeit it's going to be quite a bit different than most of the topics that we typically cover that fall into the realm of foreign policy or national security or the economy or history, a little sprinkle of history now and then on Smarter News, which I always enjoy. The topic that we're going to cover today is about one of the most infamous unsolved murder cases in America. And we're going to discuss this because there was a significant break in this case. There was an arrest in just the last several days. And now a question about whether or not that arrest is actually going to lead to more answers. So before we jump into this topic, I just want to offer this gentle reminder, unlike our other interviews, this topic is not for young years. It's not something I'm going to be playing in front of my entire family because it is difficult and it is dark at times. And our mission at Smarter News is always to provide quick, concise, nonpartisan information. I want it available for the whole entire family as all of us are really busy. So I'm always thinking if you have three minutes of your day, how can I provide for you the news that you need to know and why it matters. And one of the big problems with news today is that you can't just have it on in your living room anymore because there's either going to be some tawdry topics that maybe you don't want to listen to or you don't want to expose your entire family to, or there's so much debate about these topics uh, that you really question whether or not there's news value. And if I can't explain what's going on and why it matters, I like to avoid it. And sometimes with crime stories, they fall into that category where you're really questioning the news value. And I'm very sensitive about crime stories because I think there's a very thin line between providing and reporting information to the public and exploitation. Exploitation, again, of the victims in the pursuit for more clicks or more views and that's not something I want to be a part of. That really bothers me. But this story also bothers me. And because of its significance, because of the facts surrounding this case, I do think it's it's important to cover. I actually started covering this story about 10 years ago. I was a national news anchor at the time. I traveled to the site of these crimes, which was in nearby Long Island. I was reporting out of Manhattan. And I found the whole case very baffling for a number of reasons. I was new to that case. It had been a case that had been in the news, but because I was covering business news for a long time, it was new to me. And I couldn't understand how there were so many unsolved murders and no one seemed to know why, who to blame, what happened, or whether or not there was still a real threat to the community. And so why does this story matter? These murders have gone unsolved for more than a decade. The crimes happened just a short drive away from America's largest city, New York City. They happened in Long Island in Suffolk County. Suffolk County Police Department is one of the largest police departments in the United States. And the investigation also received federal attention uh, to varying degrees at different times, which is part of this case, which we're going to talk about in just a moment with our guest. And so here's a little background. And we're going to go over all of this. But the background to this is or these few facts, difficult as they are. So there were remains found of mostly young women along this desolate stretch of highway near what I would describe as an ocean marsh, just full of bramble. It was very difficult. It was a very specific part of this highway. The victims included a toddler. Another victim was a biological male believed to be working or dressing or living as a woman. And let me connect the dots on that. Most of the victims were believed to be sex workers. Sometimes you might hear the term escort, prostitute, sex worker. Sometimes these are interchangeable. And the profile of the victim being young women and being sex workers likely impacted this case in several ways, including in some of the media coverage. It's just human nature that the reaction could be at times insensitive as it is, but this is the reality and we deal in facts to sort of shrug this off and say, well, you know what, this, this is a very dangerous field of work and bad things happen. And both of those things are true, but it's also true that the families deserve answers as to what happened to their loved ones. And if this is indeed a serial murderer or murderers that's on the loose, then there could be a huge threat to the entire community. So just for the sake of argument, just think of this, you know, instead of calling these victims sex workers, call them teachers, call them college students, call them scientists, and think about how that would change the nature of the story and the urgency 
to solve this crime. Many viewed these cases and the lack of momentum around these cases as egregious. You know, how can all these families not know anything about what happened to the ones that they loved? And just to underscore this, we're a nation of laws. And when the justice system doesn't seem to be working, doesn't seem to be working on behalf of those who are the most vulnerable, we have to ask why. And that's one of the questions that journalists ask often is, well, why? Why isn't why don't we have answers here? What can we do to help? But despite the best efforts by those in law enforcement and those in the press, there weren't any notable leads for years and years and years. And the justice system didn't seem to be working in this particular case until just days ago when we suddenly heard this from the Suffolk County District Attorney, Ray Tierney. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming. Um, you know, I'm standing here with uh, my law enforcement partners in the Gilgo Task Force uh, to announce uh, the indictment of defendant Rex Andrew Heerman, 59 years of age. Uh, he's been arrested by the Suffolk County uh, Police Department's homicide detectives, and he's been indicted uh, in a grand jury present, uh, presentation by the, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office uh, for the murders of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. Uh, the, the investigation of Maureen Brainerd Barnes is ongoing. Uh, these young women went missing between July of 2007 and September of 2010. They were found in De uh, December of 2010 by the Suffolk County Police Department, and then there was nothing, absolutely nothing. For, their, for the next 13 years, their cases went unsolved until today. So a cold case is suddenly hot again. And now the national spotlight is back on Long Island. And we know that there's a suspect in custody under arrest charged with at least three murders being looked at potentially for a fourth. But we also know that there's at least 10 victims overall. So this may be a piece of the puzzle, but maybe not the full puzzle. And so there's even more questions. And I knew I wanted to do some further reporting on this and talk to someone that really had knowledge of the case, you know, and I was wondering who that would be. Would it be the detective that I walked the area with a decade ago? Would it be a forensic expert? Would it be a local journalist? I wanted someone close to the story, but not too close. Someone that could offer an outside perspective, a skeptical eye. And in my research, I stumbled upon this amazing podcast called Unraveled, the Long Island Serial Killer. By the way, there are those that believe that there are killers, which is also part of the story. There's so many layers to pull at. And this seven-part series was incredible. And the depth of the reporting and unraveling, for lack of a better term, all the different pieces to, to this crime, asking a lot of really important questions. So I reached out to one of the investigative reporters. Her name is Alexis Linkletter. She's a Long Island native. She has a very interesting personal connection to this case, which I'll let her explain. And what I found out is this series was first reported in 2020. So the seven episodes came out in 2020. This is how long this story has been looked at. So now we are three years later. I look for Alexis. I find out she's actually in Long Island as this announcement is being made about this arrest. So I reached out to her and she is our guest today. Alexis, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So how long in total have you worked on this investigation or the topic of the Long Island serial killer or killers? So I have been investigating and documenting in all of that for about eight years total. And I began investigating it because really I was looking into the political corruption occurring in the Suffolk County Police Department with the police chief and the district attorney who had have both been convicted for the corruption. Um, but that's where I started. I thought there was a story there. And it was then that I realized that those two were overseeing the beginning of the investigation. And that's when I realized like, okay, it was neglected and that's why it wasn't solved. And that's sort of how it all started. And, and it's just grown from there. So of all the police departments in the country where you could take a look at perhaps corruption, why did you choose Suffolk County? What was the connection there? So the connection there is that I'm from Suffolk County. 
I was raised on Long Island in Smithtown, which is exactly where the corrupt police chief lived and also went to school. Um, and the reason why he was outed as being corrupt prior to the connection to the Long Island serial killer case was because he brutalized um, a heroin addict who was in custody. And that heroin addict was a guy I went to high school with. And we reconnected once I started working in the true crime space. And basically what happened is his name's Christopher Loeb and he was addicted to drugs and he would break into cars to basically support his habit. Um, he would steal from cars. And on one particular night, he broke into the Suffolk County police chief's car and stole a duffel bag out of the car. And inside the duffel bag were like sex toys and pornography and all sorts of things like that. And then the police chief tracked him down, ripped him out of his house, brought him to the police department and beat him up. And then he was silenced for several years. So that was what I thought the story was. And only when I started really researching and realizing everything else that was connected, did I realize that like, okay, there's a Long Island serial killer connection here. And there was. How did it go from, hey, my high school friend says he was roughed up by some cops and there's a story here to, wait a minute, there's this other murder mystery that this is somehow entangled with. So in learning about this corrupt police chief, I turned over every stone to find out as much as I could about him. And it was really the timeline of his career when he was installed as the police chief coincided with the discovery of probably a very significant victim in the Long Island serial killer case. And her name is Shannon Gilbert. And it was the search for her that was the catalyst for the discovery of all of these bodies. So the corrupt police chief was installed right when her body was found. And the timing seemed really odd. And from there, the investigation just completely fell apart. The second he was in charge, everybody was fired, all of the original investigators on the case. Um, he installed his own people. And I just sort of looked at him and his timeline and when things got really derailed with the Long Island serial killer investigation. And there were too many coincidences for there not to be a connection there. And that's really how it went from a political corruption story to a Long Island serial killer story. Can you give our audience just a little bit of background? When you say Shannon Gilbert and her, you know, her remains, she goes missing and her remains are found. Can you just talk to us for those that are completely unfamiliar with the area, give us sort of the setting and who these victims were and where they were found? Sure. So Shannon Gilbert was working as a sex worker and she was hired by a John who lives on the very east end of Long Island. And it's a place called Oak Beach. It's a super remote, private community, pretty affluent. Um, she shows up at her client's house and basically she ends up fleeing from the home on the phone on the phone with 911 saying they're trying to kill me. Um, she's frantic, all of that. So she disappears that night um, and the search for her begins probably a week or so later. And it's that search of this entire vast area. You know, the police ultimately find a body on a stretch of beach called Gilgo Beach, and they think it's going to be Shannon Gilbert, but it wasn't. Then they find another and another and another, and none of them are Shannon. Then they start finding body parts. None of them are Shannon either. And it's at that point they realize they have a serial killer, but they still don't find Shannon, who's the reason all these people are found in the first place. So Shannon is found more than a year after she disappears in the community where she went missing, which is so odd. And it's right at this point that this new police chief is installed. And another thing to know about this community is that a lot of politicians live there. A lot of politically connected people live there. Um, a doctor who refers to himself and Others have referred to him as like a police surgeon. He had close ties with the police department, treated a lot of police officers. Like all these people are in this enclave. I'm, we're talking like 60 houses, right? This is not a big community and it's really remote. So there's just a lot of questions when you look at those circumstances. That community, I, it, since I, I was unfamiliar with Long Island, I grew up in San Francisco, so it was as far from San Francisco as possible, going out to Long Island and seeing this stretch of, of land, I really want to emphasize that to our audience because it's so, it's like something you never, 
I've never really seen before. This yeah. long kind of desolate stretch of highway, and then you you lead into these houses uh, that could be considered. I mean, sort of like bayfront or beachfront. They're not really beachfront houses, but it's definitely an exclusive kind of isolated area. Oh yeah, I mean, every house has a waterfront view. Um, it's the depending on where you are on Long Island, it can be rocky. So they're not like exactly like beachfront, but as close as you can get, you know, um, it's definitely, they're definitely waterfront properties and so remote. I can't emphasize that enough. Like, and there are no other neighborhoods near this. Um, so if so you're running, if you're running away from that area, it's not like you could walk, you could not walk to that area or <laughs> you would have to really be specifically going there and leaving there. To, uh, yeah. And there's right? no sidewalks. Like if you try to leave this neighborhood, you're just on a highway with, water on each side basically it's like an island almost so did the police chief in question that that you started looking at did he live in that area did he have friends in that area and where did that where were you suddenly like why what's going on here with this investigation so he definitely had friends in that area he definitely had ties to this area and he was where things got really interesting is we learned that he was going to parties in this neighborhood this very small neighborhood and he was hiring sex workers and having sex with them after the bodies were found in the same neighborhood. So the theory was then it's like, okay, obviously you derailed this investigation and you didn't want the FBI helping, which is something that happened because you didn't want them to find out what you were doing with sex workers in the same neighborhood. Cause the hubris, I mean, that's how, how can you possibly, he wasn't the chief when he was doing it. He was, he hadn't been promoted to chief yet. But as a law enforcement officer, and the bodies of these sex workers are being found a stone's throw from here, and you're you're hiring them, and you're having sex with them, and you're patronizing them during this investigation. It's it's shocking. I mean, it's almost unbelievable if we didn't have proof that it was true. And but and what was his name? James Burke. So James Burke is is now he's at a really high level in law enforcement, one of the biggest police departments in the country. He comes into real power when this investigation is really heating up. Yes. And as you point out in your reporting through your series, he actually had a documented. This isn't just like, oh, we're talking about a police chief that could be corrupt. There was documentation going back to when he was not in a position of power of of doing this, of drugs, having sex while on the job, right? That that was all, that was all part of a question of how did he suddenly become police chief with that sort of background? Exactly. So he had been in trouble for hiring sex workers and, and engaging in that in uniform in his police car on the job in the 90s. Um, he was accused of smoking crack in the 90s. He got a slap on the wrist and then he was back to work. And it was, you know, all of these internal affair documents were released where they were leaked um, about five years ago. But I mean, the police department knew about them and they still allowed these promotions, which is shocking. And so when he comes in to become police chief, you mentioned something about the FBI and kind of clearing house. So sometimes when people come to power, they're going to make their own decisions. They're going to put their, you know, their friends or promote the people that they want part of their team. What struck you as odd of what you learned about what he did during that time? So given the the overwhelming nature of the serial killer series that there was 10 plus victims, uh, if a if the FBI, which is the most resource, you know, able, like they have more resources than any other department. Why would you reject help from them? The FBI came in, they're like, Hey, we'll help you with this. We'll help you solve this. And they basically blocked them from being involved. Wouldn't let them see any of the evidence. Um, yeah, just, it just seems odd. Like, why wouldn't you want the help? from the FBI if solving this case is important to you. And it's because it wasn't important to him. He didn't want it. He didn't want the FBI poking around and uncovering the truth about his own indiscretions. So there was more questions about him as well as being related potentially to these crimes, which we can get to in a second. He, there's no tie to it. He denies it. There's, there's nothing of that nature. But the, in, your, in your reporting, this is some of the things that you're untangling. What did you learn about the victims? As the victims were identified, what stands out most to you about the victims? So what stands out to me most about the victims, and I've talked to several of their family members, at least of the identified victims, because several are still unidentified. I just, you know, the empathy I have for the reasons they were in sex work at all. You know, I, I think people need to understand that sex work, because it's illegal and because there's no 
recourse for them to have any safety many of them were in desperate situations situations where it's like they're trying to keep roofs over their children's heads or highly addicted to drugs and the desperation there and no resources for rehab or you know it's just it's just not as cut and dry as like they were sex workers these were not positions they wanted to be in um these are positions they were forced into or coerced into in because they were in abusive relationships and i think that that's the saddest thing to me it's like sex work and people who do it it's not a monolith and it's it's a string of painful events that lead them to those to, to to be forced to make these decisions to get into it knowing that it's dangerous and to be in that position to know that you're risking your life imagine how desperate you must be to do it and i think just a lot more empathy is deserved for women who find themselves in those situations. It's one of the things that really struck me about your reporting. It's it's one of the first places I've gone where we've had such a, a good profile of the victims and understanding that there were just a few choices that got them there. You know, in some cases it was, they were just a few choices away from a different path that yeah. they find themselves in this situation. You know, even with all of that, Alexis, it would be really easy to say, wow, this is a real, this is a real strange um, there's not a lot of new evidence. This is a desolate area. There's not that many more clues. Okay, the, there's corruption in this department, but you know. So what was the, what was the impetus to keep going? Why did you feel so called to keep pushing through and actually put together a report on this specific incident? There's so many different crimes in America. What was it about this one that really spoke to you? I just love Long Island. I'm from Long Island and I didn't know the history of this department was so checkered. Um, the corruption didn't start with the Long Island serial killer case. The injustice didn't start there. And while there's really amazing upper brass installed now, I mean, there's decades of injustice as that's occurred. And once you start talking to those people involved in this case, you're just you're just not done you can't be done until there's an arrest. And, you know, starting like three months ago, I have another podcast that's weekly um, called The First Degree. And we have been doing weekly coverage on each victim, like as a fundraising and information initiative that we were doing way before that we knew the arrest was coming. And that's because there had been no media coverage since October of 2022. So for us, we're just like, why why isn't anyone talking about them? I mean, these families of these victims are suffering. And I can imagine that they have like Google alerts set on their things. And to not have coverage, you know, if it were me or you and we had been murdered, think about like the Natalie Holloways or, you know, the Gabby Petitos, like it would not have stopped until there was justice. And I can't imagine having these stretches of just nothing. Um, people the perception that maybe people were losing interest or that, you know, momentum in the case was waning. I just, I can't, as in like empath, I can't deal with that. And um, it meant a lot to me to just keep trying to at least keep their names in the media. Well, it sounds like your instinct was also telling you something. And what a, what a coincidence of that, of saying, you know what, 90 days before this takes place, I just have to keep their names going. And we got to introduce a new audience to them because it's new people. Did you have any inkling? No. Based on that any arrest was coming up that we've seen. No, so just no. to catch everybody up, we just got an arrest in the last few days. This is a right. developing story. We're going to learn a lot. But did you have any, there's no sign that maybe there was a break in the case. I've heard rumors that like they're watching somebody, but it was just rumor. It's like, sure. It was so vague that did I think they were working on it? Yeah, I did. Um, but like I was skeptical. I was hopeful, but I was skeptical because I'm just like 13 years. I mean, what could they possibly be doing that they hadn't already done? And turns out a lot because this administration took it seriously and really mobilized and the previous had not. You mentioned something that came out in October of 2022. So before we get into to this chapter of it, so you record the series again, that's out in 2020. Uh, obviously there's a huge pandemic. There's a lot of things going on in the news. Then something comes out. There's some new evidence that is that police released that Alexis in 2022, like suddenly they decided to go public with some things. Yes. Yeah, so 
one of the big things in Unravel that we talked about a lot was our criticism of the police department of not releasing evidence in a seemingly timely manner. And then in 2022, two things happen. So they release video surveillance of a victim named Megan Waterman um, leaving a hotel lobby, which is where she was last seen alive. And we were kind of like, why are you, why did you wait so long? But now we know why. Now we know that it was part of their plan. And, you know, it it really makes you want to take pause before you criticize something like that again, because it turns out they had already identified the suspect that is now in custody when they did that. And they had already started monitoring his internet activity. They'd already started monitoring his phone activity. They had already had warrants and subpoenas and he would, they did that to see what he would do. So they were basically stimulating him just to, to watch and collect more evidence on him. So I think in hindsight, I'm like, wow, that's a very strategic move. But another thing that happened around that time, and don't quote me on that being in October, but I know in 2022 is when they released that, that footage. Um, they started, they're obviously trying to identify one of the unidentified victims. Um, she's known as Peaches. And it was around that time that a police department in the South was circulating information about her saying that they're looking for family members. So they've identified a family tree that she likely belongs to. And they're close. It seems as though they're close to identifying her. But the last reporting on that was in October of that time of last year. Got it. Actually, I have the time that I wrote it down from you. This oh, yeah. is your reporting. So mm -hmm. don't worry, Alexis. You're, oh, you thank have, you. you. I don't know how you keep all of this straight. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks like in, in March of 2022, this is, and perhaps this is also from the district attorney, some of the things that, uh, that he also shared yeah. in the, in the days that, that as, as we're talking about this arrest. So mm -hmm. March, 2022, when they started, this is when they started tracking this now suspect with this Rex, Rex Hewerman, I believe yeah. I'm saying his last name correctly. April, 2022 is when the hotel video is released and you have this woman, you know, leaving a hotel and we know that she's not going to survive this night. And so it did seem odd to the outside, like, why are they doing this? And, but this was all part of their plan. So what was the new technology? What have you learned? Because by chance, by chance, you're based in LA, obviously have roots in Long Island, you're in New York city and yeah. you get this, so this ping on your phone that there's something yeah. going to happen. So tell us about that. Tell us about how suddenly you find out there's a break and you happen to be there. I was there for work for my other podcast, the first degree. We were doing a big event there and, um, I actually found out Thursday night, I got a tip that somebody was in custody and I was sort of like, is this true? Because if it is true, I need to cancel my weekend and, you know, and then I didn't sleep at all the entire night because I was like, if this is true, you know, I was like spinning. So in the morning I find out it's true and that's it. I was supposed to go to a concert that day. I'm like, nope, I canceled everything. And then I just headed out to Long Island to start like talking to people and that's what I did. And I was shocked. I still have not even taken a second to be like, I cannot believe that they were like, it's shocking. I, I can't process it still. So what did you learn though? What was the new technology? What was the break in the case that suddenly was here that wasn't there 10 years ago? So there was no new technology. There was nothing new. That's what's frustrating. And that's why what we didn't unraveled and talking about the police chief derailing the investigation, like we were right. This evidence was there all along. Um, there was a scenario connected to a victim named Amber Lynn Costello. And it turns out the day before she went missing, she had an encounter with a, a disgruntled client really. And there were witnesses to this incident that occurred. Apparently, you know, they were supposed to, you know, he booked her for a date and he paid her. And then an associate of hers showed up and kind of scared the guy off and she kept the money. Um, it turns out that he texted her and was like, hey, that wasn't nice. Like, do I get credit? And then somehow she agreed to see him the next day and then she was never seen again. So the witnesses to that incident the day before gave a description of this guy, you know, a guy between six, four, six, six, he was driving a first generation Chevy avalanche. He had glasses. Um, and this description was sort of just sat there. Um, 
there's no evidence to suggest that it was pursued aggressively. Um, and it was really, my understanding is that the Chevy Avalanche was the linchpin in all of this. And upon the new task force being assembled, some very dogged investigator searched for the Chevy Avalanche in a database. And once they found it and found this name, they were able to connect everything else to him because it turns out they had DNA, but he didn't have a record. So a DNA sample without a match is useless. Um, and there were they had phone activity, but they were burner phones. A burner phone without connecting it to a name is useless. But once they found the Chevy Avalanche and the name of the person who owned it, then they were able to put all the puzzle pieces together. They collected serin tip, uh, like abandoned. They they collected an abandonment DNA sample, you know, from his trash, and that's how they were able to like actually piece this case together. They were able to find him like buying burner phones and connecting his IP addresses to these burner phones and stalking the family members of the victims on these burner phones. And it all came together because of the Chevy Avalanche. But it's frustrating because this is information they had in 2010. You know, um, why did it take 13 years? This is just old fashioned police work. It wasn't groundbreaking technology. So it's a little frustrating, I'm sure, for the victims' families to know that they had to suffer longer than necessary. And there's also that question about was anything else happening during that time? You yeah. Know, was if this is indeed a murder and everyone's innocent until proven guilty? Again, he denies these allegations through his lawyer. Was was he dangerous to the community overall? I mean, imagine if that's your neighbor, and that's something you actually were able to go and go to mm -hmm. his neighborhood, weren't you, Alexis? What did you see when you were there? What do we uh, know about this guy? He is – so to answer your questions, I mean, he was a danger to community while he was out and about. He was still going on dates with sex workers that were getting really horrible feelings. A lot of them, you know, pulled the plugs on the dates because they were afraid of him. Um, but the neighbors, I think I think everyone's startled, you know. Um, I talked to several people who worked with him at this point. He was able to maintain just – a double life where he appeared to be just this like nerdy architect with, you know, this vast knowledge of building code in New York. And that was sort of his specialty. And, but that's not who he is. Who he is is a serial killer. And the architect is like the mask he wears, you know, he grew up, he's living in the same home that he was raised in. Um, it's decrepit and the neighborhood is not, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Um, we know that He's married, but his wife filed for divorce today. We learned that he has a stepson and a daughter, a biological daughter, whose lives now he's ruined. I'm sure he feels nothing. I mean, people like him don't feel anything. They, they can't. You know, you can't stalk your victim's families and, like, revel in their pain and feel something for your own family. That just doesn't jive. You know, like, every part of his life that appeared normal was just a mask. You know, it was to help cover up who he really was. Did you talk to any of the victims' families that had been contacted by someone after after their their loved one went missing and then turned up to be murdered? I have not talked to those ones, um, but I have talked to – like I talked to Megan Waterman's sister. I've done several interviews with her, and, you know, she told me that her father just told her – to stay under the radar, don't go online, don't be in involved in anything involving Megan's name because he was worried that this guy was still out there. And she just said, you know, I thought my dad was crazy, but he was right. You know, he was keeping tabs on all of us. Um, and he does that as – those are his, like, psychological trophies. Like, he likes to see what he's caused. He likes to see the damage he's done. And it's why he was talking to other women he's gone on dates with about – the Long Island serial killer case. He wanted to see what they thought because he gets off on that. Like he loves the attention. What have you learned in the days? So after the snooze breaks, you go out to Long Island. Uh, you eventually come back to Los Angeles. We're talking while you're in Los Angeles mm -hmm. now. Even before this interview, you had a series of phone calls that you were trying to make gather new information. What have you learned? What do you think is really important uh, that you've learned? I'm sure you're still kind of synthesizing all of it. Mm -hmm. uh, what stands out most to you based on some of the conversations that you've had about 
about not only this particular individual, but maybe the case overall? Well, I was always, not always, since the beginning of my research on the case, I was open to the fact that there were, there was one killer and that's it. And that you could explain the variation in MO with somebody maturing in their deviance um, because it starts obviously the early victims, there's dismemberment and the latest victims, you know, 2007, 2010, the four that Rex Hurman's being accused of being involved with, they were not dismembered. Um, now I think, no, I think Rex Hurman did the four and I think somebody else did the others. And I don't think that these are the only deaths that will be connected to Rex Hurman, but I think by the time he, Maureen Brainerd Barnes was the victim who was abducted and murdered by him in 2007. The, the three, three murders that followed were so similar to Maureen's that it's like he already knew what he liked. Like his MO was so defined that like it couldn't have been the first because you'd, I feel like you'd see some variation. Like it'd be like, oh, well, I'm going to do this this time and this, and maybe like some progression, but it was it was as though he already knew exactly what he was going to do and exactly what he liked. And and there was such precision in what he did. Like he had a different burner phone with each one. They were placed almost 500 feet apart. They were basically like, you know, it's just, that's what I learned. I learned so, he's an architect. He's precise. You know, he's, it's almost, there's almost a geometry with the way they were left you know, like equidistant. Mm. And I just don't, the others don't align with this sort of meticulous side of what we're seeing of this person. Um, so I think that is like the most shocking thing I've learned where I was completely convinced that I was like, oh, this could totally be one person. And I had a whole theory about it. And it's just, I've completely changed my mind. Um, yeah. Based on what we've learned now. And so again, these are the the allegations that against him, and we'll see when he actually faces them in court. What what's actually said? Does does it actually go to trial? We don't even know that. Is there any connection between him and the police department? Is there any anything that you learned either connected to that police chief? By the way, the police chief that we mentioned, James Burke, did go to prison, serve time for the treatment of your friend. Yeah, um, he's out. Yes. He's li living in Long Island still. Yeah. But is there any signs that this Rex Hewerman person was connected to any of these people in power? Not yet. Not yet. But I'm learning some stuff. I mean, I haven't had a moment to actually like dig into the because like there's interviewing people and then there's like the paper trails, which is something that I really love to do, but I haven't had time yet where you like pull property records and you pull, pull like where people went to school and you try mm -hmm. to make these connections. Not yet, but I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, nothing surprises me, but not yet, but it's still so early. I mean, we're not even a week out of his name being released and people, the internet sleuths are going crazy. And these people are so good at digging up information on whoever. So I'm sure there's a lot more to come. What about these other victims? Yeah. You know, what do you, what do you think we, it, do you think we're any closer to finding out who's responsible for them? I do think we're closer because my faith in the police commissioner and like the, my faith in the police department, given the new developments, they could be really close to solving that. And we just don't know. I mean, they were able to keep a lid on what they were doing. So now that morale's high, I'm sure. I'm sure they know a lot more than we know or think they know. Just thinking about it now, it's, it's frightening. I mean, it's frightening just to even reflect a little bit, a little bit on this entire scenario. Um, have you ever? I was I was thinking about this while I was listening to your interviewing, and now thinking about it, have you ever felt personally threatened or intimidated your safety? because of the, some of the questions that you've asked in this case and who you've asked them of? No, because what I found is people in power go after the vulnerable. And I am lucky enough where the exposure and the fact that I was able to do the show and the podcast kind of protected me. Um, the ongoing, the theme here that I learn over and over is, you know, 
Rex Hewerman went after women who wouldn't go to the cops, who were struggling with addiction. You know, so did James Burke, you know, people who no one would believe or take seriously. And they're not actually that powerful. They're not actually that dangerous. They're just dangerous to the most vulnerable and marginalized people. Um, so no, I never felt physically threatened. Um, no, because that's not their MO. Like they're afraid of people like me and you who can, who have a platform or who are not afraid to ask questions. Mm -hmm. It's true. You asked a lot of good questions and I was amazed at the amazing resources, the people that would talk to you. I mean, yeah. some of the phone calls you guys would place, I'm like, there's no way this guy's going to talk. And then he starts talking. You're like, <laughs> it was not easy. Right? I mean, we didn't show the rejections. Uh, we didn't show the number of rejections that we received. And, um, I'm sure of it. There's a lot I, of rejection I, involved. <laughs> I'm like, I have know, a lot of experience with that. You just got to keep going. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a person who had like the confidence to be hung up on a thousand times, but you just, you make yourself do it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you did because it is, yeah. a, it's an incredible body of work uh, that you can only build on. And, and a reminder that uh, good journalism matters, good investigative work matters and keeping the victims as the priority oh, yeah. matters. And no matter what you did, and even look at your work over the last couple months, you know, you brought back the victims. You could have, you could have brought back the potential perpetrators, mm -hmm. but keeping the focus on the victims, I think is, is, is so incredibly important. This is a tough question, but uh, as we sort of finish up here, what do you think you've learned from all this? I mean, eight years of your life, you're looking at this. I know you've looked at a lot of different cases, but are there some practical lessons that you've learned? Is there some personal reflections that you walk away with, um, whether on the justice system or about crime or about the country? You know, what are some of your thoughts just uh, being so seeped in this work and then kind of if just for a moment taking a step back and saying, you know, what is the takeaway here? Well, I think, and this is something I've been saying for a long time, but it, it just keeps getting more and more reinforced every time there's a development in this case. But what happened here with the Long Island serial killer and the negligence, negligence of the case, it's a microcosm of what's happening kind of everywhere. Um, and, you know, absolute power, it's dangerous and power that goes unquestioned and unchecked is dangerous. And unfortunately, it's like we're seeing the same types of people committing these types of crimes over and over again. I, these, these serial killers kind of all look like they're all the same kind of unchecked sociopath they don't really vary much in race or age when we're catching them. I mean, it's some, the hubris involved or the arrogance, it's just a constant we keep seeing in people who think they're entitled to other people's lives. And I do believe that, you know, and the people who derail the investigation too, it's like unchecked power is really the ongoing theme here. And the exploitation of sex workers, the belief that they don't have human rights, the objectification, the, you know, just the treatment of them in the media also is very harmful. Um, and that's really the, the two main themes that I keep seeing. It's interesting. A profile bias in a couple ways you're mentioning there, not only of the victims, but also thinking about the, the people at the tops or the the people at the center of these cases, which are the criminals, the real yeah. criminals. Yeah, definitely. And so, see, so you're saying you're seeing some pattern in that, that there's oh, a pattern. Yeah. I mean, the the treatment of sex workers in general, I mean, it's it's not, it's getting better. I mean, we're using different language and um, when there's pressure put on police, they certainly seem to be acting, but they're not, they're not objects. And they certainly have their murderers deserve to be investigated properly. Well, it looks like at least for part of this case that there's something developing and I'm being very careful with my language because yeah. we have a long way to go before a conviction sure. and whether or not we even get to trial. And then we also have these other victims. So what are you going to be watching for Alexis? What is the, what are the next couple of weeks look like for you? What are you going to be thinking about? I would just, I just want to, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think we're going to get any more information until there's a trial. But again, there's no death penalty in New York. So in the first thing he asked when he was arrested was like, are they talking about me in the news? 
he might want to go to trial just for the like titillation of it because that's going to get him off. Um, I, I hope to learn more, but the other side of me really wants to spare the family any more details because what we know is horrific and I wouldn't, I don't want them to have to learn more about the, the horrific acts that occurred. Well, and that brings, I mean, that's, it brings up such a great topic, which is, do you think this, you, because I've talked a lot about this on Smarter News, I'll be just curious your thoughts on, on it. There is an exploitation that does happen. And it's not just of sex workers, it's of any victims of, of churning over the details and the details are more salacious. And listen, there's, there's human nature. That's just curious. It's, it, there's a dark side of, of these crimes and people are curious about it. And I understand that curiosity. We all yeah. have that curiosity of like, well, what, what actually happened here? Like, what are the details? But where do you think, do you think the line was not drawn enough here where the victims just did not get the attention or do you think they were exploited again? They've been, now they're just kind of being exploited again because it gives everybody the opportunity to listen to these horrific details one more time. Yeah, I think, you know, unfortunately, there is an appetite for details, you know, even the most gratuitously violent ones. And I think that's disgusting and unnecessary. Um, but hopefully it's the attention on the case that pushed it to get solved. You know, it's the only silver lining that you can find or, or like grasp for when knowing that these families had to read these headlines, you know, the old reporting used to refer to the sex workers as hooker. Like, I mean, I can't imagine having my family members memory dim diminished in such a way or degraded. Um, but the only silver lining I can hope to grasp, like pull from that is like maybe all the reporting helped it push forward. But yeah, I mean, it's disgusting. There's no reason for it. Well, hopefully this leads to, again, will lead to some more answers, maybe lead to more arrests. And ultimately, we're all looking for a safe community. Yeah. And if somebody that is out there committing crimes is free, that's not safe for anyone. And it Correct. doesn't matter what your profession is. So that's just a good reminder about that. Well, Alexis, thank you for your work. I encourage yeah. everybody to check out your multiple podcasts. We'll make sure to have links Thank um, you. now that they have an idea of, of what you're doing. And we'll try to keep up with you and yeah, see what we you. learn over the next several months. But thanks for the time today. I really appreciate of it. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Quick, concise, nonpartisan, smarter news, a refuge from the storm. I'm Jenna. Thank you for choosing smarter.